sound system back on. Sorry about that. Okay, first, you might have thought that homework is done, but it's not. I was going to assign a homework that was due today, but I didn't remember until Thursday around 10 or 11, and I figured the good students would have sat down Wednesday afternoon to try to do the homework. It wasn't there, and I don't want people to you know, get to the last minute. What? I didn't know there was homework, so that's why there's no homework that was due today, but there will be homework due on Monday, so don't forget to check. Um, second thing, we will do the course evaluations on Monday. So if you have a laptop, please bring it to class because I'm going to dismiss early and encourage you then to complete the um, course evaluation. Oh, yes. <laughs> Anybody know what this picture is? It's like the old Jesus in the first one. But I'm just like, how does he even know Jesus looks like? Besides Jews. Well, we know because we have this. <laughs> this is called the Shroud of Turin. And it's an inter interesting story about radiometric dating. So when we get there, which probably won't be until Monday, we'll talk about radiometric dating and how that plays into our Shroud of Turin story. Last class period, we finished up talking about the quantum numbers to describe an atom. How many quantum numbers were there? Four. Four. What are they? They're the energy level. Okay, the principal quantum number that tells you the energy level. The orbital. The orbital that tells you the total angular momentum. The magnetic, which tells you the orientation. And when I say it tells you the orientation, it doesn't tell you what direction it's pointing, it tells you how much it's pointing parallel to the magnetic field when you put a magnetic field. And then the last one? The, the spin magnetic quantum number that's not actually spin. It has to do with the orientation of the magnetic moments of electrons that don't spin. That's a, a misnomer. It's an anachronism because when they noticed that they had a magnetic moment, they assumed it came from spin. This picture here and, of course, that linked orbitron for everyone who wanted to go there but didn't think of doing it is showing us what the electron densities look like for different sets of quantum numbers. So here's just a, a quick review of the L's, the orbital quantum numbers, and how many electrons would go in each one because of the Pauli exclusion principle. Pauli exclusion principle only applies to fermions. What are three examples of fermions? Electrons, neutrons, and protons. Right, electrons, neutrons, and protons. There's only three we talked about. But all of those have the same rules. So when we talk about nuclear physics, which is what we're going to be talking about for today, those are made out of protons and neutrons, which are also fermions, which means you also have a Pauli exclusion principle for the energy levels of those things in the nucleus. Why does an atom like uranium have far more neutrons than protons in the nucleus? Have you ever thought about that? Have you noticed it like in chemistry class? If you look at the periodic table, you have, of course, hydrogen comes in three varieties. You have hydrogen one, which we normally call hydrogen, one proton, no neutrons. You have hydrogen two, deuterium, which has one proton, one neutron. Hydrogen three, tritium. Obviously, you can have a stable nucleus with different numbers of nu neutrons. The proton is what tells us about its chemical behavior, because the chemical behavior has to do with electrons. And to make a neutral atom, you'll have the same number of electrons as protons. So if it has one proton, it's always hydrogen. You just have different variations for different numbers of neutrons. Helium typically has two protons and two neutrons. But you can have helium-3 with two protons and one neutron. You come down to uranium. Uranium. Uranium has 92 protons. And uranium is uranium-238 is the predominant Isotope. Isotope is the term we use when we have two atoms that are the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. So hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium are all isotopes of hydrogen. For uranium, the dominant isotope has 238 total nucleons. If you have 92 protons and 238 total things in the nucleus, the nucleus is just protons and neutrons, so how many neutrons do you have? Mm -hmm. 
If you use the new common core math techniques, which are tricks that we should have all learned after we learned fundamental math, the easiest way to do this is to realize that 92 is 8 less than 100. So I'll take 238, subtract 100 to get 138, and then I'll add that 8 back in to get 146. You can go that way, Lisa. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing about common core math is they are all common tricks that we should have learned, but you still need to learn the fundamentals before you just learn tricks. If you learn tricks first, it's going to fail you. So we have 146 neutrons and 92 protons. Way more neutrons than protons. The other isotope that exists in nature has 235 nucleons, three less neutrons. So you have way more neutrons than protons. So that's where this question comes from. Why does an atom like uranium have far more neutrons than protons and nucleus? So what are your conjectures? What do you think? I think it means it for stability. Yeah. It means it for stability is absolutely the right answer. And I don't know if you had any underlying knowledge or if you were just going with everything you've learned about the electrons, but everything is based on what's the lowest energy state. And so to be stable, to be in the lowest energy state, it turns out you need a lot more neutrons. But then the question becomes, why? To separate that positive charge. OK, you guys are like totally all over this. Did you learn this in reading quiz in another class, or are you just guessing perfectly correctly? <laughs> well, yeah, there's no guessing. I used my natural skill. And, and you very well could have. I mean, it's a very well thought out answer. So with the nucleon, nucleons, nucleon is the term for anything inside a nucleus. We have protons and neutrons. Protons have a plus charge. So I'll put a plus there. Neutrons have a zero charge. And so the forces that we have learned about in physics so far, what forces have we learned about? Gravity. Gravity. Gravity is one of the four fundamental forces. So we've learned about gravity. Does gravity act between protons and neutrons? Yes. Technically, yes. In practice, we ignore it because gravity is the weakest of the forces. It is the most important one, I believe, because ultimately when you talk about astron astronomy, wow, I almost said astrology myself. We talk about astronomy, gravity is the dominating force. It's what crushes everything else to make a black hole. But gravity is the weakest of our forces. So when we're talking about inside a nucleus, we ignore gravity. Okay, what other forces have we learned about? Electromagnetic. Electromagnetic. Once again, you guys are totally on top of this. There are other ones you could have answered, like friction and normal and spring. But those are all actually derived from electromagnetic. Right, so gravity, electromagnetic, that's all of the forces we've learned. They can all be broken down to one of those two. But for the nucleus, we introduce two additional forces. So we have four total fundamental forces that we know of. We have those two, gravity and the electromagnetic, and then we have the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force. Why do they have the term nuclear there? Two reasons. Number one is these forces, just like the others, they have to have a charge. What was the charge for gravity? Mass. Mass was the charge for gravity. And mass was unipolar. There's only one type of mass charge, positive mass. Electromagnetic, we have the electric charge. Now, we just talked about electrons having an intrinsic magnetic charge. Well, magnetism, as I understand it, can be completely explained with relativity and electric force. And somebody actually had a reference to that in one of their scrapbooks, which I thought was cool. Um, so with electricity, we had two charges. What were those? Positive and negative. Positive and negative. Now, with the nuclear our charges are a little more confusing. We have <clears throat> things called quarks, and those quarks come in three varieties. They have three types of charges. 
And so scientists, we've already used up, you know, one, you didn't even have to have a name for it, right? It's just get two that came up with plus and minus. And of course, if we go to Maxis and they have north and south for the charges there. For this, because there's three, they turn to the eyeball. The standard human eyeball has three cones. One that is called the blue cone, because we see blue best with that cone. One that's called the red cone, because we see red best with that. And one that's called the green cone, because we see green best with that. That's why the three primary colors of light are red, green, and blue, because it's based on our eyes, based on biology. And so because there's three types of charges here, they call them color charges and name them red, green, and blue. So what, what has these color charges? What has the quarks? Things that we call baryons. And what are baryons? Bary means heavy. So the heavy particles. <laughs> It's a bad name, it turns out, because, for instance, a tau lepton, leptons are light particles. A tau lepton is more massive than a proton, which is a barrier. So the names don't quite work. But for our case right now, I don't think we're going to get into particle physics because I think we're only going to have one more lecture and then two lectures of review. <laughs> um, we'll just say protons and neutrons are baryons. Baryons are particles that are made up of quarks. A proton is up, up, down. A neutron is an up, down, down. And so this strong and weak nuclear forces, they only act between these things that are made up of quarks. And they're very short-range forces. So if I have a proton here and a proton here, the force is virtually non-existent between them because it's a short-range force. They basically have to be touching for the force to work. And so these are the forces that hold the nucleus together. And they're very short range forces, only next door neighbors. And it's always attractive, just like gravity. So if I have a nucleus that has a proton, a proton, a neutron, a neutron, I'm going to have the electromagnetic force is pushing like this. And then I'm going to have my nuclear force, um, change to blue, my weak and strong nuclear forces pulling these together. So I'm going to put my arrows like this because it's pulling them together and pulling these together and pulling these together and pulling these together because they're all next nearest neighbors. And so we have other than we have. Like you're raining with a whole bunch of protons, the electromagnetic force is much more long range. So I'm, of course, not going to try to draw a uranium atom with 238 things in the nucleus. But so let's say that I have proton there, proton there, proton here and the rest are neutrons. So in this case, I would have a repulsive force between those two protons, repulsive force between those two protons, and repulsive, repulsive between those two. But I would have attractive forces between every pair that's touching. So I'd have attraction between this, 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 right? Well, if you have a lot of things, because of the long-range nature of the repulsive force, the repulsive force is going to grow more as you add more things than the attractive force because it's only next nearest neighbors. So if you put more and more things in the nucleus, the repulsive force grows faster than the attractive force. And the way to make the attractive force increase is to put more neutrons in so you can space farther apart the protons and decrease it because remember the electromagnetic force decreases with distance the separation one over r squared so that's the reason why the uranium atom has a lot more neutrons than protons because you need to space out the the repulsive positive charges putting in the neutrons they're going to be attracted to both protons and neutrons Radioactive decay. We've already done the demonstration twice of 
what's going on with radioactive decay, with the nucleus being in an excited state and falling to a lower energy state. And there's a lot of different types of decays. The three we talked about in our lab were the alpha decay, beta decay, and what was the third one? Gamma. Gamma is not shown on this chart for a very simple reason. What is an alpha particle? It does not penetrate as far. That's correct. It's a helium nucleus. It's two protons, two neutrons. Why two protons, two neutrons? That's super stable. In the terminology of nuclear physics, we call them magic numbers. In the terminology of the electrons, we just said when the shell is full. Just like hydrogen helium, the shell was full when we had two electrons in the ground state, right? So according to Maria Geppert Meyer, you should have a similar energy states in the nucleus. And if you have two protons that are both in the ground state, <coughs> the protons are indistinguishable. So they're fermions, indistinguishable. They have to have Paul exclusion principle. You have complete shell, it should be really stable. Likewise, neutrons, neutrons are distinguishable from protons, so you can have the same state for a proton and a neutron, but the two neutrons would have to be in the same, you know, two can fit in the lowest energy. So you have two in the lowest for each. That's like a magic number because you have two and two. So that's a very stable product. The nucleus kicks it out, and if you kick out a helium nucleus, say you start with uranium, if you take away two protons, you move to the left two on the periodic table, and that takes you to, I see you looking, Trace. What does that take you to? Uh, thorium. Thorium. And so that's what this is showing. Here we have an alpha decay. Things are going down and to the left are alpha, so this is an alpha. And so it took it from uranium-238 to thorium-234. Why did it go from 238 to 234? Because four nucleons left. Why did it go from uranium to thorium? Because two protons left. Now, beta decays. What's a beta decay? It's an electron. Now, there's no electrons in the nucleus. And so it's more complicated than something just being kicked out. It actually occurs when a neutron gets destroyed, produces a proton and an electron and then a little thing we call an electron antineutrino. But the net result is an electron comes out of the nucleus and the number of protons Z goes up by one. Since I've been taking this class with C++, the plus plus means increment. So Z goes up by one. Now there is also a thing that we call beta plus where you kick out a positron from the nucleus. There's no positrons in there either. And it's just fundamentally the reverse. A proton gets destroyed and creates a neutron and a positron and an electron neutrino. So you can also kick out positrons, but those aren't part of our decay scheme here. What was the gamma? It was a photon. It was an electromagnetic wave. That's energy without bringing any nucleons out or changing any nucleons. So that's kind of like the sound we heard when that fell over. It was a sound wave when that fell over. Here it's a light wave. And so a gamma decay doesn't change the nucleus. Hence, those aren't shown here. So this is showing a decay sequence. If you start with uranium-238, that's the vast preponderance of uranium. It decays first with the alpha decay. In lab, we studied half-life. This is the half-life. So if the half-life is 4.5 billion years, what does that tell you? It shouldn't decay anytime soon, statistically. But what if you have billions times billions of uranium-238 nuclei? Because in, in the smallest rock of uranium, you're going to have billions times billions of uranium-238 nuclei. You'd be, now when you say all different stages, 
there, there's not stages of decay per se. There's only undecayed and decayed. But each one has a certain probability of decay. And if you wait 4.5 billion years, then statistically half of them will decay. Half of them will still remain. And so it's going to take a really long time for half of your uranium-238 to decay. Now the other isotope that exists in nature is uranium-235. It has a half-life of around 700 million years. 700 million years is a long time, right? But if you compare it to 4.5 billion years, it's a very small time. So in the history of our Earth, Let's suppose we started with equal amounts of uranium-238 and uranium-235. After 700 million years, how much uranium-235 remains? Half. How much is uranium-238? Way more than half. If you go out to 4.5 billion years, you have half of uranium-238, but you've gone through, what, approximately seven, almost seven half-lives. And so you have one half to the seventh power or 128 roughly. So you have far less uranium-235 than you have 238 after four and a half billion years. Well, surprise, surprise, scientists believe that our Earth is about four and a half billion years old. And so we should have far less uranium-235 if we started with equal amounts because of the different half-lives. Now this is showing continuation Thorium-234 undergoes, what kind of decay is this? That was the beta. You have, there's the key. Undergoes a beta decay. So the number of protons is increasing by one. The number of neutrons decreases by one, leaving us with 234 still, because we still have the same number of things, but one more proton. Notice the half-life here, 24 days. Compare that to the decay time for the uranium-238, that's nothing. And so as you go through the sequence, the time limiting step is the first one. Everything else happens so quickly compared to the first one that when we talk about radiometric dating, we'll ignore all of the other ones because they're so short. The next beta decay, 6.7 hours. Now, going for uranium-234, that's not a common one. That's one that only occurs through this decay and decays in 250,000 years, well, 250,000 years compared to 4.5 billion, actually, yeah, 4.5 billion years is nothing. And so you also don't have any appreciable amount of uranium-234, even though it's a product that's going to be produced when the 238 decays. And then you have thorium, rad radium, radon, polonium. For those of you who have paid attention to um, Gentry's I can't remember his first name now, um, but his polonium halos, it's this here that is the key that he's talking about there. Um, I, I won't go into it now, but you end up with all paths lead to, notice here's your first occurrence of lead, but that's not the end. You go through all of these things and you end up, no matter what path it takes, at lead 206. So this is a decay sequence that can be used for radiometric dating. That is, you measure how much lead 206 you have, you measure how much uranium 238 you have, you make an assumption, an assumption like, here's a first order assumption, that all of my lead 206 was originally uranium 238. And then you can say, okay, so I have this fraction left. How many half-lives have I gone through to have this fraction left? And so doing the decays, just like we did in the lab, gives you an age. And now we're going to go through this, just showing the decay sequence so we can understand the process. And we will get to some math. Um, I'm going to go quickly through this because we've already mirrored. I just have a quick question. As a future science teacher, like if you have, like, Talk about creation the old Earth and the new Earth. I understand how you could explain the, the years and things with old Earth idea. How would you be able to, if someone has a question about the new, the young Earth, as I meant, creation, how would you explain yeah. some of this? Well, the, <laughs> we, we usually talk about carbon-14 dating. And carbon-14 dating is highly relevant to a young Earth creationist because carbon-14 has a half-life of about 
5,730 years. And we have so little carbon-14 created in the atmosphere, and it's, it's coming up later, um, but it can only date out to about 50,000 years. But still, if you're younger creationists, the Earth is a lot younger than 50,000 years. And we have some things that have no carbon-14 in them that used to be living. And so then how do you explain that? Right? This is, this is the first half of your answer. How do you explain that? And the answer, as I learned from um, Paul Heen, is, well, the flood changed the earth considerably. And so you know, a traditional belief is that before the flood, there was some kind of water barrier above us. You know, a lot of scientists will ridicule it, but that's a traditional belief. And that water barrier would have changed quite a, many, quite a number of things here on earth. And one of them, it would change the atmospheric conditions. So conceivably, you could have blocked all of the, um, the neutrons that are creating carbon-14 in our atmosphere. So there's no carbon-14 in the atmosphere. And thus, anything from before the flood would have no carbon-14 now because it had no carbon-14 before. And then after the flood, when the water barrier breaks down, then the amount of carbon-14 rises, and anything that dates from 0 to 60, or 6,000 years ago, would, or 4,000 years ago, would simply be from that time very soon after the flood when the carbon 14 is so that's a create a young earth creationist explanation for carbon 14 dating now for other dating right things that geologists use for dating they don't use carbon 14 typically because almost everything they're trying to date is older than 50,000 years so instead they use things like this lead um uranium lead dating or potassium argon dating or strontium rubidium dating, those are just different starting and ending isotopes. And in those cases, they do, um, they, they take different minerals and they do dating on the different minerals and then combine the information from the different minerals, they can actually extrapolate to say how much of the parent and the daughter product you have initially and how old it is. And so this is called the dating by isochrons method. And the main attack that young earth creationists will make on the dating by isochrons method is mixing. If I have this sample that is, let's say, 5,000 years old, and this sample is 2,000 years old, and I mix them together, I can get lots of different dates. And so they say, you know, all of these dates that are getting there very long must be the result of mixing. So th those are the arguments that are made by young earth creationists to counter. Okay, talking about bombs, the godfather of nuclear power and bombs. So, what do you know about bombs? Hopefully not much, right? Stay away. <laughs> yeah, stay away. That's, that's a good rule of thumb. Well, after, after it was discovered, remember Einstein equals MC squared. After, after it was discovered that through radioactive decay, you're giving off energy through that E equals MC squared, people start studying this. And they realized that you could make a, a reaction that continues or even grows. And so Enrico Fermi, working at the University of Chicago, was the first person to make a nuclear pile, which batteries are called voltaic piles. He was the first person to make a nuclear reactor. And, you know, if you look at the date there, he won the Nobel Prize in 1938 for his experimental work. Um, it was soon after this that war broke out in Europe. And as war broke out in Europe, well, you know, we were all okay. We, we'd been through one of these before. And then the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, which Nathan had to write a review on recently, right? on the bombing of Japan, including the atomic bombs. Um, yes, you're talking. Anyway, don't worry about it. So Japan brought us into the war. And in history, you know, people can talk about, maybe we knew, maybe we didn't. Just like with 9-11, some people will say we knew beforehand. Soon after we were brought into the war, American scientists noticed that there was a change in scientific communication prior to this point, and even after the war started, scientists still communicate civilly. The scientists weren't at war, it wasn't their thing. But suddenly the German scientists 
stopped talking and they stopped shipping uranium. And the American scientist said, oh no, you can make a bomb out of this and that bomb would have enormous destructive power. And so they wrote a letter to send to the president and it had Albert Einstein sign it because well, he's Albert Einstein. I'm gonna have him sign my letter too. And they sent it and they said, the Germans could be developing a bomb. And that bomb could completely change the balance of power. We'd all be speaking German now. So we need to do it too. Because if we have it, then they won't use it. <coughs> Actually, probably a weak theory given Hitler, right? So that started the Manhattan Project, where American scientists first got together at the University of Chicago and started working on making a bomb using this new nuclear physics thing. And then after they got a little into it, they're like, you know, maybe we shouldn't do this in the second largest city in the country. Because back then, you thought Chicago was still the second city. Which is why you have second city TV. Don't care. So they said, let's, let's move somewhere where no one lives. New Mexico. No one lives in New Mexico. And so they moved to New Mexico. <laughs> And now New Mexico has a couple top-rate labs because, well, they moved to New Mexico. And they worked on building a bomb. And, of course, they were successful. Now, to build this bomb, they need to have the right kind of uranium. They need to have uranium that was uranium-235, two, er, yeah, two but we just said that uranium-235 is a really minor component because it has a shorter half-life. So they had to enrich it. And so I believe it's up in Richmond, Richmond, Washington, where I worked, that they enriched the uranium. They actually went through a process where they took uranium in rock and they chemically changed it, you know, chemical reactions, you guys all take general chemistry except for a couple, well, one. They chemically changed it to create uranium hexafluoride, UF6. And uranium hexafluoride is kind of liquidish. And then they put them in these huge centrifuges and they spit them around. Well, when you put something in a centrifuge, y'all, except for Nathan taking chemistry, what happens when you put it in the centrifuge? It separates by density. The more dense stuff would be on the outside, well, what's more dense? Uranium 238 or uranium 235? They're both the same volume, but 238 has more mass, so it's more dense. So the uranium 238 hexafluoride is on the outside. Uranium 235 hexafluoride is on the inside, so they scrape the inside. There's your enriched uranium to make a bomb. They also made a plutonium bomb. Plutonium is created by taking your uranium 238 and bombarding it with neutrons, which creates neptunium. Bombard the neptunium with more neutrons, and you create the plutonium. And I believe that's what was done at Oak Ridge National, well, in Oak Ridge, um, Tennessee. So, quick question. Um, I was studying that for the practice because I needed to understand. How that worked or whatever. So, well, my question is, I thought, I mean, neutrons. How do you, do you just have like a? How do you? Where do you get the neutrons to? You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. Where do you get them from? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you where I get them from. I get them from plutonium. Right. We have a plutonium beryllium source so just, there. So how do you like separate it to just? Well, I don't like know, in my case, tweezers. is what? Very small tweezers. Very small. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good answer. Good answer. How do you like yeah. separate? Yeah. But, I, I think they found radioactive isotopes that emitted neutrons. I'm not sure. Um, but they, they bombard them with neutrons to make that happen. My, my, mine is circular because I have plutonium. We have to have the neutron emitter to make plutonium, so you can't use plutonium to make plutonium, right? Um, well, I suppose you could. But So they made these bombs, and then, of course, as we know, they dropped them. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Depends on where you dwell. They dropped the first one on Hiroshima. Yeah. Dropped the second one on Nagasaki just a few days later. So there we have where they dropped them. Is there a bat? Bat. We got a, a, a firm bat. Well, no, that's not. Uh, it's it, not, it, it, it's it, not it, firm. That was yeah, good. Yeah, it depends on this. It depends on destroyed it. many lives and property. Yeah, we have an end of the war, and that was good. What do you say, Mary? No, I say it's not good. Mary says it's not good. A lot of people were affected. I, one of my classmates in grade school, her dad lived in Hiroshima. 
and he was visiting his grandparents on the day the bomb was dropped. And he was actually walking back to town when it blew up on him. So he would go testify to Congress when these things came up, because when I was a kid, we weren't that far removed from it. So was he like an affected by it? He was not. Okay. But the bombs killed, what was it, like, I... I think it was a hundred thousand people like that was gone. Crazy. I think it was a quarter million. And, and then, and then like is also radio over the next twenty years you have about that same number die again. And, and then it also releases a lot of heat into the atmosphere. So that and creates a lot like of weather it. phenomena and stuff. So it killed a lot of people. And you know, they, they dropped one first in Hiroshima, then a few days later in Nagasaki. And there's a lot of conspiracy theories about this, I don't know if they're right or wrong, so I'm not trying to diminish them. Some people say that the Japanese were ready to surrender before we dropped the first one, and we wanted to drop both of them so we could see what they actually did. If that's the case, that's truly evil. I mean, truly evil. If you just kill hundreds of thousands of people to see if you could. At the same time, the conventional story is we were carpet bombing Tokyo over and over, every night, just bombing the dickens out of Tokyo, killing more people than were killed with nuclear bombs. And the Japanese people, generally speaking, were not the type to surrender. I mean, you might have read, you know, within the last 20 years, they've recovered a couple soldiers who still thought the, the war was going on, and they were still ready every day to fight. You know, 80 years old, whatever. And so, some people are of the belief that the Japanese would have never surrendered if we had just continued with the status quo. I mean, it would have, it would have taken us wiping out every man of military age. Other people contend, like I said, that, well, they say that Roosevelt knew that we were going to get bombed by the Japanese to begin with, and that we knew the Japanese were about to surrender, and we wanted to try to bomb some the people who worked on this, they thought that they were doing a holy work. They thought they were doing God's work. They were protecting the American way of life from a very evil way of life. I also really thought that the fear of it alone would stop wars in general. Which which it has, because we really haven't had a world war since then. Yeah. We had plenty of wars, mind you, but nothing that's gotten everybody into the mix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, be careful. Um, the people who worked on it after it was dropped, they were like, what have we done? There is no justifying making something this evil. And so many of them, they, they truly thought that they were doing the right thing, and then after it was dropped, they felt great remorse. Mm -hmm. And what did military people say? More. Yeah, more, more, this is great, this is great. And so, you know, scientists learned that through fusion, you can release even more energy, and they were like, Let's make a bigger bomb. Let's make a fusion bomb. And so they actually tried to recruit the same people to make a fusion bomb. And Oppenheimer, who had led the Manhattan Project, he was the project leader, he said, no, I am not going to make another weapon of war. And so he was ostracized. He had always been somewhat of a commie pingo, but he was working on the bomb because it was necessary. After it was made, he was like, that was a horrible thing. I'm not going to make a bigger bomb. And then he was ostracized as a communist. Mm -hmm. um, it only took a few more years to come up with the, the fusion bombs, which carry a much bigger boom. And so these days, that's what nuclear bombs are, is they're the fusion bombs, because they have a bigger boom. So wait, what, what type of bombs were dropped on? Those were fission bombs. So what's the difference in fission and fusion? Fission is breaking a big thing into small things. Fusion is taking a small thing, combining it into big things. So let's get to some equations. Here is the equation, a, an example equation. It is nowhere close to the only equation for how nuclear fission occurs. So you start with these two things, a uranium-235. Remember I said you have to have 235, not 238, and a neutron. The neutron hits it. These graphs have a funny name. It says neutron cross sections. Neutron cross section, what that means is the probability that a neutron will be absorbed by the nucleus. 
So the cross section measured in meters squared or barns is um, a barn is not a meter squared, but a barn is proportional to meters squared. That cross section is actually a probability of being absorbed. Remember, everything's probabilistic when you get down to quantum physics. And one of the things that's real important is the probability of being absorbed if you have a fast neutron is pretty low. The probability of being absorbed moves way up if you have a slow neutron. Notice um, these are logarithmic scales. So slow is much more likely <clears throat> to be absorbed. We call a slow neutron a thermal neutron. Notice it's thermal in quotations. Thermal means it's in thermal equilibrium with its surroundings. So that speed, similar to a speed a neutron would have if it was just hanging out by itself in normal under 1,000 Kelvin temperatures. So we have to have slow neutrons to have this likely to occur. The neutron is absorbed and you make a uranium-236. Number of neutrons went up by one. But uranium-236 has a little star. That means it is highly unstable. It immediately breaks. And then this is the part that is just one of many options. Breaks into two smaller pieces. This example says barium and krypton. But there's a lot of other variations you could have. Breaks into barium and krypton. If you look at the numbers, this is, for instance, barium-141. Michael, you're the closest. What is the number, remember it's barium 56, so you can find it with the 56. What's the atomic mass for barium? Right there in the sixth row, the second one. 137. This is 141. That's four more neutrons than is standard. And then krypton, 36 and 92. So if you find krypton, let's see, krypton is in the noble gases, the fourth one down. So 83, so we have, well, let's go with 84. So we have about eight more neutrons than the normal krypton does. These are highly unstable nuclei, and they themselves are going to further decay. But this also gives off three neutrons. How many neutrons did it take to start the reaction? One. How many do you give off here? Three. So for every reaction that occurs, how many potential reactions could occur in the future? Three more. This is how you make a bomb. If you have one reaction that releases energy, it causes three to release energy, then each one of those causes three, you have nine. Nine times three is 27. Very quickly, you have a very, very large number of reactions occurring. What do you call people who specialize in this, I guess you can say? Nuclear physicists. Yeah. So this picture here is actually showing the, the distribution of the two items that are pr produced in the fission. And you can see this is just one example. You just have to have them one from here and one from here. And the number of neutrons varies with that as well. So you have lots of different radioactive products you're going to make. But the key is these neutrons are coming out really fast. Huge amounts of energy released. Huge amount of energy released. Temperatures go up, things expand, you have a big percussion. It's a bomb. Of course, I don't like bombs. I like nuclear power plants. I'm a big proponent of nuclear power personally. I think that we should turn to that. We have all of these naturally occurring radioactive rocks. We take those naturally occurring radioactive rocks and we separate them to the parts that we can use for nuclear power and the parts that we can't, the parts that we can't, well, they can be used as very dense materials like in dumb bombs. They make bombs that don't do anything but hit the ground, and they're really heavy. If you use spent uranium, uranium that's depleted of 235, it's very dense and it's not very radioactive. That's what they use. So we dig it out of the ground, we separate it, we use the 235 to break into smaller pieces that are going to be actually more radioactive, which means that they're going to be radioactive for less time. Because if it's more radioactive, you have more decays per second, which means it takes less time to get rid of all of it. 
and we get as a byproduct lots of energy. Does that sound good? I, I think it is. What are downsides of nuclear power? Okay, the waste, you have to find a way to get rid of it. We try to do things like, hey, let's take an old salt mine in Yucca Mountain. Let's excavate. Let's put it in there and seal it up. Let's spend millions of dollars getting it ready. Now let's spend millions of dollars not using it and filling it back in. Because that's the way our government works. Um, people have plans on how to get rid of it, but that's the big concern is what do you do with it? You dug it out of the ground as radioactive. Seems you should be able to bury it back in the ground as radioactive, but that's one of the big problems. What's another concern people have with nuclear power? Something goes wrong. <laughs> Something goes wrong. You've all heard of Chernobyl, right? Chernobyl, as I understand, this is at least what I was taught when I was in college, and it only occurred like three years before I was in college. They were testing to see how quickly they could recover from an overheat situation. But they got too far. It's kind of like me. I was telling you about testing how hard I could push on the staple before the staple would go through my thumbnail. I pressed too hard. There was no recovery. They pressed too hard. It blew up. And it released copious amounts of radio radiation into the atmosphere. So people like in Finland, you know, had to take their iodine because there's a lot of radioactive iodine in the air. And, you know, lots of problems there. The town, if MacGyver is any indication of reality, is now occupied by punks playing hard rock. And it's, you know, they had to evacuate. Very bad things can happen. So care has to be taken. Now, a question to make sure you understood at least some of the things I've been talking about. Why must neutrons be thermal? What is the heat and measure of like activity and movement? Yeah. So they have to be moving after they have to be moving. First of all, does thermal mean fast or slow? Slow. So they have to be slow because plutonium and uranium, and uranium can only absorb slow neutrons. Now, I'm going to tell you a story that is relevant to help you remember this. This Christmas, I saw the guy that I did this to and felt guilty all over again. <laughs> Back when I was in college, I took the education curriculum because I wanted to be a teacher. And we had to take you know, um, classes on curriculum design and whatnot, and we had to present a lecture. And one of my sister's friends from college had a physics, I don't know, specialty. And so he gave his on what we've just been talking about here. And he didn't mention thermal neutrons all the way through. And so I'm sitting here. The end, okay, so any questions? And I raise my hand. Physics major, my senior year. I read in the book that these have to be thermal neutrons. Why do they have to be thermal? What's that even mean? And you like looked at me don't believe. You know, I ruined this presentation. It is important. Um, if you're going to make a bomb, they have to be thermal neutrons. They have to be slow moving. Otherwise, they're just going to pass through and not be absorbed. They basically they can go through the nucleus. The nucleus just goes. Like atoms, it shrugs. Okay, getting back to topic and some things that we can have homework questions on with calculations <laughs> with one minute. The radius of a nucleus, they're tightly packed. And so the volume is just basically the volume of one nucleon times the number of nucleons. And since the volume is pi r cubed, well, four thirds pi r cubed, then the radius is just a constant times the number of nucleons to the one third power. So the radius of a nucleus of an atom is about 1.2 femtometers. Remember, femtometer means 10 to the minus 15th meters times the number of things in the nucleus. A, we call the atomic number, or a is the atomic mass, excuse me, and A is the number of protons plus neutrons. Z, the atomic number, is the number of protons. And you also have N, the neutron number. And I've totally run out of time without getting to this very important equation. 
We'll do lots of calculation on Monday, and then you'll have the last homework assignment. There will be homework assignment due on Monday. So that's fine. And, yeah. well, the Wednesday will be the last one. Wednesday you'll be actually doing calculations for energy released in nuclear reactions. So Mira. Monday and Wednesday. The final scrapbook can be over anything. Okay. Just make sure you have the total number. Oh. All right. Have a happy Sabbath. <laughs>